Thanks for inviting me. Uh, I'm going to talk about a few issues that are relevant to intellectual property uh, in the biotechnology area. Uh, effectively, each one of my slides has been a hour-long presentation for a different group. So I'm going to go through 14 slides and roughly a half hour. So <laughs> I think perhaps you can take away a few things. There, there are these things out there called patents, and they're relevant to medicine, and they're relevant to uh, research, and relevant to biotechnology. Uh, there was a recent Supreme Court case. The Supreme Court doesn't hear many patent cases, but when they do, they uh, tend to screw it up pretty badly. But um, of course, that's my opinion, not necessarily um, that of the winner. Um, and then the third thing could be that patent attorneys are actually pretty boring to listen to for a half hour, but we'll, we'll see how that part goes. So in order to set the stage a little bit, how many people have heard of patents? How many people? Oh, well, that's pretty good. Do you know the difference between a patent and a trademark and a copyright? Or a trade secret or okay so I thought I'd go through real quick background on intellectual property basics again one slide um, talk a little bit about the history of the industry and biotechnology and uh, pharma and the patents they've gotten and then talk about the recent developments and then give um, uh, an unsolicited opinion on um, where things are going so Basically, four basic types of intellectual property. Trade secrets, copyrights, trademarks, and patents. And there are different types of patents. Um, trade secrets. It's just something that's maintained as a secret. It's not the same as being maintained as confidential. It has to be maintained with secrecy, such that maybe only two people in the company know, or uh, the Krispy Kreme donut recipe is a secret, for example, and only a couple key executives at Krispy Kreme know the entire recipe. When they order ingredients, they, you know, they have one per person order the flour and another order the sugar, and they never get together on how much is it. Um, Coca-Cola is another example. They last forever as long as they're secret. If they lose their secrecy, if the former employee discloses the secret, it's gone forever. So it's a great form of intellectual property as long as you can maintain the secrecy. Um, and you can't enforce it against anybody else unless they're trying to steal the secret. So it's a little different. Uh, copyrights, um, works of original authorship, you know, manuscripts, instruction manuals for your PCR machines, um, software is copyrighted. Um, form of intellectual property. Trademarks. Trademarks are uh, marks or badges or logos on things that identify the source of the good. So if you see Roach, their trademark, um, you know that it's made by uh, Roach Molecular System. If you see Coca-Cola, you know that it's made by the Coke company, or Coke is made by the Coca-Cola company. So that brings us to patents, which are distinct from all those three, and each one of those is distinct, and each one of them uh, actually is almost a subspecialty within the um, intellectual property legal profession. So um, I've, I've given you the sum of my knowledge on the last three, but uh, what I do is patents, and uh, you've all heard of patents. Patents have been in the news lately. Uh, most of you have heard about Samsung losing um, a patent infringement lawsuit to Apple and the battles back and forth based on the iPhone. That was actually on a design patent. That patent covered the outline of the phone. There are hundreds of other patents, uh, literally, that cover how the iPhone works. Those are called utility patents, and those are the typical kind of patent you'd find in biotechnology. Design patents protect furniture design. The chairs in here have a design patent. They can protect a consumer product like a, um, a blender, um, but it's just a design. It, it's not how it works. Then there's a fairly rare type of patent called the plant patent. We're not going to talk very much about it, but it covers asexually reproducing plants like roses. And if you ever have a desire to visit the patent office, they actually have kind of a neat room that's filled with all the 
rose patterns because they have to submit color photographs. So if you're into horticulture, it's a, it can be a neat place to get it. So in the U.S., patents granted by the U.S. Patent Office. And it is a process here where you file an application and then the Patent Office takes a look at it in a process referred to ex as examination. The process of applying and having it examined is referred to as prosecution in terms of the applicant or their lawyer prosecutes the application in the Patent Office until it becomes a patent. Um, the basic requirements for a patent are that it has to be patentable subject matter um, and that's actually what the change in the law um, talks about and there's been a change in that recently that's the development I want to talk about. But the other requirements are that it has to be new. You can't patent something that's not new and your patent has to be unobvious or not obvious over what was known before. So you know, determining whether something is obvious or not can be difficult and that's where most of the litigation and that's where most of the prosecution, the arguments lie. You know, would, would this invention been obvious if you knew about you know, the three other uh, existing technologies? So that's the primer on patents. Patents last 20 years from the filing date. Um, they, uh, unless it's a design patent, which is 14 years from the issue date. And um, effectively, utility patents, if they issue in uh, two or three years of prosecution, they're roughly about 17 years from the issue date. Uh, this key point here, the rights granted from a patent are the rights to exclude others from practicing the invention claimed in the patent. And patent claims are um, written like meets and bounds property description. It's a right to exclude others. It's a right to keep somebody from walking on your property, the, in a real property analogy. It is not, however, the right to do what you have patented. A patent does not confer any right to the patent holder to actually make, use, or practice the invention. Um, and that right um, and I've, I've highlighted it with red here, but that issue is continually confused by um, everyone. And you know, uh, 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 all right, so you've all heard me say that. Do you, do you understand the distinction? So how can one person get a patent and somebody else get a patent on uh, the same or something very similar without the first patent? Um, rendering the second patent not new. Yeah, I mean, there, there's usually a difference. A good example would be, um, and my favorite examples uh, to use in these situations, chocolate chip cookie. I could have a chocolate chip cookie patent which comprised dough and chocolate chips, let's say. Okay. Um, Russ could have decided that um, gee, it would taste a lot better if you put pecans in it. So he could get a patent as long as I hadn't disclosed or nobody had ever used pecans before on a chocolate chip cookie that covers dough, chips, and pecans. Russ could never, can't make his cookie because I have a patent that covers you know, anything that as long as it only has dough and chocolate chips. So the additional you know, ingredient does not get him out of the scope of my patent. Now in contrast, just because I have a patent on chocolate chips and dough, I can't put pecans in without uh, infringing Russia's patent. So you end up, and this is very common in industry, you end up in a cross-licensing situation. If I want to make chocolate chips with pecans, and he wants to make chocolate chips with pecans, we license each other's patents, which is a contract to allow the other party to use the patent, and then we both compete in the marketplace. So if he doesn't license my patent, and goes off and uh, makes chocolate chip cookies with pecans, I can bring an action against him for patent infringement in U.S. District Court. And I can stop him from using the making, using or selling chocolate chip cookies, and I can also collect damages for what he sold. So, and that's effectively what you know, Apple versus Samsung is. It's a 
patent infringement lawsuit. Uh, you know, a, a takeaway from patent infringement and patents, patents are just business tools. And um, how many uh, know the damages that were awarded in the Samsung suit? Any recollection? There were, there were, there were roughly $3 billion. So Amsung, uh, excuse me, Samsung had to write a check to Apple for $3 billion. The uh, courts are appealing. Um, however, by selling the infringing phone, Samsung made $27 billion. So they're $24 billion to the good, even if they you know, infringed Apple's patents. And companies don't actually infringe patents on purpose, but you know, from a business decision, Samsung thought they had a legitimate argument that they didn't and went ahead and made $24 billion, which could have been 27 if they hadn't been found to infringe. Uh, I, I, well, Samsung's branded phone is the Galaxy, but I'm not sure which phone was in the case. But the, the, the alleged was it copied the design of the iPhone. I think they actually had four different models of what yeah. Apple. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> well, what usually happens in an infringement context, particularly well, a suit that large with that many products, is the parties argue about it, but then ultimately, with the court's help, agree that we're going to look just at these representative products and these representative claims and, um, and go forward for the infringement part and then damages, they look at all the sales. So, um, yeah, please. Um, well, it's, it's, it's an excellent point, but I'm going to answer indirectly. Patents are territorial. So if you, a U.S. patent gives you the right to exclude somebody from making, using, selling in the U.S. or importing for sale in the U.S. and then, or, you know, making something abroad and then bringing it to the U.S. by a process that's patented in the U.S. But it's basically centered on the U.S. Um, if you want to stop people, excuse me, from using the technology in Canada, you need to file a patent application in Canada. Same with uh, Japan, Europe. Basically, every industrialized country has its own patent system. And there are mechanisms um, under treaty where you can take a U.S. application and file it around the world and get multiple patents or try to obtain multiple patents. By the same token, each country's um, laws and what it requires to get a patent are different. So, you, you, it's, uh, well, a good example, Samsung versus Apple are also in a lawsuit in the Netherlands and the Dutch court decided for Samsung. So, they tend to go for a product that's sold worldwide. Pharmaceutical companies are, um, one example of companies that on a um, composition of matter, a new drug, may file, uh, we, we've done a filing where we filed in 97 different patent offices for a um, pharmaceutical company. So, you know, that's, and, and it ends up being very, very expensive because each country uh, has its own fees. Um, patents were actually, the basis for the patent system was set forth in the Constitution, and um, this is um, Article One, Section Eight. Congress shall have the power um, to promote science by, and you can read the rest, uh, giving inventors uh, an exclusive ex rights for an exclusive exclusive rights for a period of time to their uh, discoveries. The grand bargain, as I phrase it is we're going to give you, we're going to give Russ the right to exclude others from the chocolate chip cookie and nuts in exchange for him agreeing to disclose that invention and promote technology sort of through the disclosure. And the disclosure also allows me, if I want to sell chocolate chip cookies but don't want to infringe his patent, to do research and determine that hey, if I put walnuts in it, it tastes just as good. 
Or if I'm Samsung and designing a phone, maybe I don't want to use FaceTime, but I figure out a different place to put the camera. So the, the whole process and kind of the concept behind patents is um, you know, the right to exclude, which could be a very valuable marketplace advantage you know, for a pharmaceutical, for example, re forces people to develop different ways to do the same thing, and that promotes technology. So, and then after the patent expires, these things become part of the uh, public good, or excuse me, free, or freely used by the public. So that was a quick tutorial on patent law, a uh, semester-long course at Wake Forest University School of Law. Um, what kind of patents do we see in the biotech healthcare area? Because uh, that's um, what the title of my talk was. Well, I talked about pharmaceutical. Lipitor is perhaps the most valuable patent ever. Lipitor, um, you can probably pronounce it, Ross. I can't pronounce the chemical name. Atorvastatin, I'm sorry. Everyone else but me can pronounce it. Um, but effectively, they have a monopoly, and that patent, uh, that drug went off patent in um, 2011, uh, fairly recently, about six months ago, when Pfizer's stock dropped you know, uh, significantly and, uh, after that. So, uh, you know, pharmaceutical patents, very valuable. And that's where you get into the whole generic drug issues and generic drugs, the reference. Um, um, well, the reference to generic is that it's uh, the non-patented version of the drug. It's a similar uh, drug. Uh, another composition of matter, for example, going way back, uh, Amgen invented synthetic erythropoietin, which was great for the Tour de France cyclist uh, until they developed the uh, test to discover synthetic. That's it's EPO. It's um, Lance Armstrong was found guilty, not of synthetic EPO. He he took his own EPO, but um, anyway, that was bad attempt at humor. Uh, what you'll what you'll see um, in biotech area, you'll see primer sequences patented. You'll see antibodies patented, and you'll also see, and that's what we're going to talk about in a little bit, genetic material patented. Literally, you know, the gene for X, the BRCA4 gene. Here's what its sequence looks like. Here are what the nucleotide sequence sequence ID number seven. Or a primer might be something that uh, it's complementary to sequence ID2, which is the DNA you're trying to uh, prime. Um, methods of PCR, Roach's PCR, all the reagents are patented. It's been a huge financial success for Roach. Um, do you have any digital PCR machines, next-gen sequencing machines here? Yeah, yeah, well, I'm sure they're. Or, Actually, if you buy a patented product, it comes with a license to use it for its intended purpose. But yeah, right, right. Well, we're actually um, we're involved um, in a current lawsuit on next-gen sequencing platform. We represent a client with patents, and we're suing one of the manufacturers. Um, this will be the next big patent war because there are a lot of different competing technologies among the next-gen sequencing uh, market. Um, methods of treatment, um, their patents in the healthcare area. Methods of predicting or prognosis, predicting somebody's uh, predisposition to Parkinson's based on a mutation on their you know, ABC gene or their PARK gene. The other things you see in healthcare, I mean, robotic platforms, not next gen per se, but as, as you probably all know better than I, because when I graduated, there weren't robotics. Um, we had the mouth pipette thing still. Um, you know, the, those little platforms that move the uh, trays around for you are, are all patented and the software covered. Uh, PCR we've talked about. Uh, big area for patenting is medical devices. Uh, the local one here is the wound vac, but Wake Forest, uh, Dr. Agenta and Dr. Moraquas patented and been very successful. It's resulted in a lot of the money that's gone into the research park. Um, and a big area now, or emerging area for biotech patents is software, because what the next-gen sequencing machines do is just generate data. I mean, 
reams and reams of data. And actually, commentators have said that the real part of the innovation or part of what's responsible for the innovation is we now have the computing power to deal with the fact that you've just you know, sequenced uh, 100,000 different uh, nucleotides. So. It has to have, um, and the whole, yes, you have to have um, utility, just like you would for a, a pharmaceutical or a new organic chemistry composition. You have to show it's useful for something. It's not typically a very high hurdle, but a sequence, uh, we'll talk about it, maybe it's actually my next slide, um, will often result you know, from, if you think of the research, it'll be, you know, we have all these tumor biopsy samples from uh, men with prostate cancer. Let's see if we can sequence um, and see what the, you know, the, if there's a mutation, and then you get the sequence and mutation. Um, the big area that you, you all may be studying, and um, uh, it, most of my work, in one way or another relates to this area now is the whole field of personalized genetic medicine, which is exploding, obviously. And um, I mean, I, I literally Googled for a, a quote I could use, but I, um, I don't have to attribute this under copyright because I didn't actually uh, take anybody else's quote. But what we're talking about is therapy targeted to a particular patient based on their genetic profile. And uh, what's allowing uh, personal medicine to move forward is the next-gen sequencing platforms, which will reduce the cost of sequencing from thousands of dollars to literally tens of dollars in bulk. Uh, microfluidics, nanotechnology, and again, we talked about, I talked about computer processing power. So uh, here are some current examples. Are you, um, Warfarin is given to heart attack patients or stroke patients, and its dosage is based on the patient's, um, whether they have specific mutations in the uh, CYP2C9 or VKORC1 genes. So literally, they do a genetic test before they prescribe you the drug because they've determined that if you have a certain mutation or mutations, you can tolerate a high dose that would be very harmful to you if you didn't have those mutations. Um, colorectal cancer treatment, based on the mutations in the KRAS gene, you will be prescribed particular uh, chemotherapy. Uh, same with non-small cell lung cancer treatment, based on your epidermal growth factor receptor uh, mutations in that, you will um, get certain therapies prescribed. Um, um, a huge area um, for personalized medicine, and maybe the, one of the first areas to be commercialized, is in parental screening. Um, and it was actually sort of in vitro diagnostic companies were at some level at the forefront of this, or their labs, because you know, they had the ability to choose. They weren't doing embryo testing per se, but conceptually, if they could do it without damage, they could look at the multiple um, embryos before implantation and uh, choose one. So parental screening would mean if there's a family disposition, uh, yeah, you, you'd want uh, cystic fibrosis, maybe a recessive um, trait, and you know, you'd want to know if um, both sides of the couple had that trait and then be able to counsel them on um, uh, the possibility of having cystic fibrosis, a, a child with cystic fibrosis. Um, prenatal screening, uh, those of you who have had children or um, your mothers um, or your significant others, if you're male, um, you know, we, we screen, standard of care in the U.S. is to screen for Down syndrome, um, and they do it with a free beta, HCG, HCG, and alpha-fetoprotein test. 
Um, there are several companies now offering genetic-based screening where literally they pick up the fetal DNA out of the mother's blood without amniocentesis and can just sequence the DNA directly and tell you initially whether the child has trisomy downs um, or trisomy 18 or trisomy 13, uh, but also eventually other chromosomal abnormalities. Um, have any of you heard of 23andMe? You know, 23andMe? 23andMe is a company um, founded by the wife of one of the Google founders, and it's been heavily funded by one of the Google founders who's, uh, I've forgotten his name, but he has a genetic predisposition to Parkinson's disease, and that may have gotten him interested. 23andMe, if you go to their website, you can, they will send you a home cheek swab kit. You put basically a Q-tip into a little vial and you send it off to 23andMe by FedEx and two weeks later they will give you uh, a report or the business model is they will let you see your report on their website which will tell you um, effectively whether you have one of 300 mutations or which of 300 mutations and these mutations uh, may relate to um, your predisposition for Parkinson's or maybe related to the ACT-N gene, which tells you you'd be a better wide receiver versus a lineman. I mean, they're literally, they've, they've uh, but that is 300 bucks. And that technology 10 years ago would have been $300,000. So um, you know, that's where it's gone. So I, I've, in order to talk about sort of recent developments um, and give you my unsolicited uh, criticism of the Supreme Court, uh, kind of have to talk about how the models worked in the past. And I think, you know, being a university setting, you're familiar with some of this. But traditionally, biotechnologies come out of research institutions, and it's been based on basic research, like many other inventions. So you have university basic research that identifies a link between an expressed phenotype, like Parkinson's or prostate cancer, and uh, genetic mutation. And what that university will often do is um, file a patent application on the mutation. So you have um, you know, the beginning of intellectual property, but you have no commercial product. What then happens under the traditional model or, is that the university will seek to outlicense that um, patent application to a spin-out company or outlicense it to an existing diagnostic lab who will, because of the patent rights and the ability to be the exclusive provider of a certain test, will spend lots of, invest money in that to bring it to uh, the public and, um, or a VC will. And the return on that investment and there's, there's a company that's now owned by Quest Diagnostic but called Athena, which was purchased by Quest. And its whole business model was literally based on licensing technology, bringing it to market, and then having this, this model, bringing a mutation to market with the exclusive rights. Um, so you had to get the test from there. So that's, that's been the traditional model. And, um, an example that's, that's relevant to my discussion is uh, BRCA1, BRCA2. Okay, the BRCA1, BRCA2 mutations, uh, University of Utah Research Foundation discovered a link between these mu specific mutations in these genes and breast cancer in Eskenazi Jewish women. And Eskenazi Jewish women and the Eskenazi Jewish population is a very... Um, it's not a controlled population, but it's a, um, I, I've forgotten the scientific term, but it's a popular, if you're an Eskenazi Jewish woman, you're going to marry an Eskenazi Jewish man, and you're not going to marry outside the faith. So it's, it's, a, um, it's a consistent population. So anyway, and so they, there are a lot of genetic mutations that are discovered first if they're in a population that's um, non uh, diverse. University of Utah Foundation filed multiple patent applications. A company called Myriad Genetics Inc., 
which was VC backed, um, licensed the University of Utah Research Foundation and developed and offered commercial tests uh, relating to a patient's predisposition to breast cancer based on the mutations. And I, uh, and it made exclusivity, you had to get the test from Myriad because they were the only ones who had the patent rights. And if you didn't get to Myriad, now they would license you to use the patent rights if you paid them a royalty, but for the most part they controlled the market. Uh, I, I probably should have prefaced all this. There are obviously huge ethical questions on, you know, the bioethics behind this, but, um, you know, in, in terms of, um, exclusivity and not. Um, and if you found out you had a predisposition to breast cancer, what do you do? Or um, the other link is to ovarian cancer. So if you're a 21-year-old woman and find out you have this link, you know, what do you do? Um, and um, th there was actually, there was a study published in Europe on the, this exact issue where they the recommendations were that every woman who had this condition should have an overectomy, which um, 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 obviously is a, a huge use. Of so anyway, ethical questions. But ignoring uh, that ethical question, so this is the model until 2001. And what happened in 2001 is that the Myriad lawsuit occurred, and this was on you know, NPR, public radio. This is one of those things that actually probably hit WXII at some point. Um, it's reported on by people who didn't have the benefit of, um, or the disadvantage of staying through this lecture, but didn't kind of have any background in patents when they're reporting on it. But associated mo uh, molecular pathology is just a, um, the title of the case, but there were uh, a number of individual plaintiffs which included physicians' organizations, scientific researchers, breast cancer advocacy groups, uh, one patient um, of uh, them, and they sued the Myriad Genetics, and they sued University of Utah Research Foundation, and they sued, uh, excuse me, sued the USPTO requesting a declaratory judgment, um, basically, um, that the myriad patents were invalid, and these are the claims of the patents, and they're going to be obviously hard to decipher, which is a, a trick we patent attorneys use so that um, we're guaranteed full employment. But effectively, the first claim which myriad had, among many others, is just a method for diagnosing the predisposition to breast cancer based on a mutation in the BRCA2 gene. So it's what I was just talking about. The second claim is the BRCA2 gene, or DNA encoding for the BRCA2 gene. So it's the isolated genetic sequence uh, that we talked about. So the plaintiff sued that the, you, these patents should never have been issued because genes themselves are product of nature spelled this way and not the way Levi spells them. Um, the law prohibits patenting laws of nature, products of nature, but the real argument was more of a public policy argument, which was if you give the right to Myriad, then nobody can get a second opinion because Myriad, uh, it, it turned out not to be true, but the argument was if Myriad has the exclusive right and you get a test result from Myriad, you can't go you know, to Wake Forest Physicians and get the test run again because Wake Forest Physicians doesn't have the right under the patent to run the test. Um, the other public policy argument was that um, the high price, the patent gives Myriad the ability to charge whatever it wants for the test, and that means the test is not as widely available as it would be if these patents didn't exist. Um, and they also raised the First Amendment concern that these patents stifled speech by um, somehow restricting scientists from talking about the condition because they were worried about patent infringement. Um, the, um, upon the initial filing, um, uh, most 
well, I and other patent attorneys um, were, were shocked that the case wouldn't be just dismissed for failure to state a claim that um, can be acted on. Um, but uh, they convinced the district court judge um, in the Southern District of New York, bought into the arguments hook, line, and sinker. He issued a um, very lengthy opinion. Um, basically, although he disagreed with the genetic sequences, he limited them to claims that are basically hard to use um, in business-wide. But he bought into all their arguments that methods for using genetic information are invalid. And the Federal Circuit, which is the um, Court of Appeals for all patent matters, affirmed that decision. Um, it used more, our, uh, it articulated the patent issues a little better than the district court. Um, the case was then appealed to the Supreme Court, not by the loser, Myriad, but by the winner, ACLU, because they didn't win on everything, they just won on you know, four of the five, so they asked the uh, Supreme Court to look at it. Um, and the Supreme Court did not render a decision. It was pending while they issued a decision on the other case I'm gonna talk about. Um, and it's the myriad's now been remanded to the Fed Circuit. And what you may remember, if, if I haven't put you to sleep, is um, the basic public policy issues behind patents um, are at odds with where the district court decision came out, and I'll discuss that in a second. The other case you may hear about, and you know, if you're, if you're in a lab or if you're working, you know, one of our clients and they're trying to develop a new test and you're on the phone with one of our attorneys and they're looking about whether there's this patent out there, and these are the kind of the buzzwords you may take away. The buzzwords are Prometheus and Myriad. So lots of patent claims may now be invalid under Prometheus or Myriad. So th those are words you're gonna hear and you can say you heard them here first or at least you can walk away and say, oh yeah, there was that funny looking guy talking about these cases. Um, Prometheus case is, um, was the Prometheus patents were drawn to effective dosing of drugs. Um, Many patent attorneys thought the patents claims should never have been allowed for reasons unrelated to uh, what the Supreme Court decided. But effectively, the claims were, you know, we'll give somebody a drug, we'll measure the metabolites of that drug in their bloodstream, and if the metabolites are below a certain level, we'll give them more drug, and if the metabolites are above a certain level, we'll reduce the dose, which is effectively kind of obvious thing to do. You're basically, if you, have, if you have a headache and take one, two aspirin, and you have a stomach ache, next time you'll take one. If the two aspirin didn't work, or two Advil, you'll take a third. So you know, that's kind of what the patent was directed to, and that's why it was way out. Uh, what the Supreme Court did, however, which introduced a lot of uncertainty, is effectively said that the claims were directed to patent ineligible subject matter, meaning they didn't get to whether they were new or not obvious. They said they never should have been considered even gotten that far in the patent office because they said it was just a law of nature um, to um, how drugs were metabolized by the body, um, ignoring the fact that my metabolism of a drug is going to be different than yours or yours or, you know, it, but again. Um, well, so what, is that, what does that mean? Uh, unfortunately, um, Prometheus did what the Supreme Court does in other situations, you know, maybe it's criminal law, and it says, we're not deciding every case, but in this case, these factors said the patent was patent ineligible. So what that means is there's a lot of uncertainty, and markets dislike uncertainty, and therefore, you know, the, the markets um, and the investment money available for biotechnology um, is less. 
the other issue, um, you know, I, I gave, I ran through a list of the kind of biotech patents that exist, and there are hundreds of patents relating to if you have this mutation, you have a predisposition for this condition, or if you have this mutation, you should take um, you know, Tylenol versus Advil, um, or you should take Advil versus you know, Alexis or whatever, uh, Aleve, excuse me. So you've effectively thrown all those patents into a questionable state. You know, what are, you know, are all those patents valid or not? And that means if you're a diagnostic company offering a test, you have to make a decision. You don't have certainty. If, if you, you know, again, the path line was university comes up with a discovery, licenses it to a um, uh, diagnostic company, and they invest money to commercialize it and get the return based on exclusivity. Well, those, these things aren't patentable, there's no exclusivity, so there's no reason to invest the money. Although people do things you know, for the public good, but it's, it's, it's different. Um, so it disrupts the developmental model. Um, it's also created the patent office examiners are not, well some are lawyers, but um, it means everything pending in the patent office, you know, the examiners, the people who look at the patent applications don't really know you know, what to do with these cases any longer. And I, I get perhaps the good news, you know, for people like me is there's just going to be a lot more litigation. And, um, you know, unless you're an attorney and um, where litigation can be profitable, but, but even I try to keep my clients out of litigation, um, almost everyone agrees that litigation is about the least productive thing for economic growth. So what we have now is a situation where we're going to have further litigation.